tal? Bienvenidos a Hello este. and welcome to this IDB seminar in which we will talk about the opportunities offered by gender equality in our region. For this, we will have with us representatives from sectors that are essential to achieve gender parity, the se public sector, the private sector, and academia. We will have a conversation about the challenges and also about the enormous potential that we can unlock in Latin America and the Caribbean if we close gender gaps. So I would like to invite you to join us in looking forward towards an equitable future. We will hear some opening remarks by listening to Jessica Vedoja. She's Chief of Cabinet and um, Chief Strategy Officer at the bank. Good afternoon, and welcome to Women Transforming the Future of Latin America and the Caribbean. I want to thank our illustrious panelists, our moderator, and all of you who are joining us. Before I continue, please watch this brief video. Me llamo Carlota Camila, soy de Venezuela y tengo siete años. Yo soy brasileña, soy de República Dominicana, nací en México. Yo quiero ser maestra y maquilladora. Me gustaría ser mamá, modelo, youtuber y veterinaria, bailarina. ¿Quieres jugar un juego? Bueno, ¿qué juego? Imagínate una historia sobre esta mujer. Me tiene un monito. Se llama... Marilla. Se ve amable. Para mí trabaja en una heladería. Es peluquera. Tiene cara de trabajar de maestra. Doctora, sí. Tiene un novio. Me parece que tiene familia porque la veo feliz. ¿Le gusta jugar a la pelota con su nieto? Ella dice que es igual a nuestra directora del colegio. Es que tiene rulos como ella. <risa> <risa> Ahora me cuentas quién era. Por favor. Yo te voy a dar para leer una frase que dice que hace en serio esa mujer, ¿va? Mabel fue la primera ingeniera mujer en trabajar en una represa hidroeléctrica llamada Salto Grande. Ah, entonces ella no es doctora, ella ayuda con electricidad. Cuando Blanca estudió para ser ingeniera, eran muy pocas las mujeres que seguían esa carrera. Luisa trabaja trabaja para llevar electricidad al pueblo indígenas en Colombia. Oh, no me imaginé que era eso. Sí, yo fiquei impresionado. No pensé que ella iba a ser, que ella iba a ayudar con electricidad. Los científicos, lo que yo sé es que la mayoría son hombres. Pero a mí me parece que deberían haber más mujeres porque todas las mujeres tienen derecho de hacer lo mismo que los hombres. Todos pueden hacer lo mismo, si quieren. Si a alguno no le gusta, que no lo hagan. Capaz que de grande pueda ser ingeniera. A mí también me gustaría ser ingeniera. Capaz que sí, porque yo me sé todo sobre números. Como sé contar hasta 30. I hope that the message of that video resonates with you. And I know it does for me. I remember being inspired by my own mom, who graduated from medical school in Quito, Ecuador in 1951, as one of just two women graduates. So, like those little girls, I had a personal view from the beginning of the challenges that women face in our region when they dare to rise up. But I also saw that strong women can be powerful agents of change in their professional fields and communities, and in societies and economies. We are here today to share our personal stories and journeys as women from Latin America and the Caribbean, or as women working in the region. Sadly, many stories of this kind are about stacked odds, obstacles to professional advancement, or the continued victimization of women. But we need to push this conversation forward with new data, new approaches and lines of action, and new success stories to reveal how those odds can change. We must change the narrative to change our context and to change the region. We at the IDB believe that this moment is a prime opportunity to do so because in the wake of the pandemic and emerging global economic stresses, the need to economically and socially empower women has never been more convincing. 
Women deserve the chance to drive recovery and growth. For the sake of development in all of its forms, we are convinced that women's empowerment is one of the true imperatives of this era. There is a lot of data out there on the scale of gender gaps, including in Latin America and the Caribbean, where the problem has been so acute and for so long. But many of us still underestimate the severity of the challenge and the toll it has taken, especially in the context of the pandemic. The IDB's COVID-19 Labor Observatory found that in the 12 countries it tracked, more than 31 million jobs were lost from February to August 2020, and women held more than 15 million of those jobs, especially in industries with traditionally high levels of female employment, such as hotels, restaurants, transportation, social services, and health. The fall represented a 16% drop in women employment from a baseline of already large gender gaps. COVID-19 erased the slow progress we achieved to close that gap. And today, women are recovering jobs less quickly than men. Behind this trend is the fact that women are overrepresented in the informal economy, while in the formal economy, they are underrepresented at managerial or director levels. In sectors such as construction, which has good rebound prospects, women do not even account for 15% of the employees. There are also few women in science, technology, engineering, and math jobs, the STEM category, which tend to be some of the best paid and most stable. Even in renewable energies, an emerging high growth industry that is key to our region's sustainable future, women represent a small fraction of the workforce, and the jobs created by decarbonization will mainly come in sectors that are currently male dominated. I should also note, that women and their businesses are often nearly invisible in many industries in our region due to limited data on their role in value chains. That means limited understanding of the particular challenges their businesses face, including lower levels of technology adoption and greatly reduced access to financing compared to male-led companies. Among our region's micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises that are women-led, a staggering 70% that apply for credit do not receive it. Now the question is, if there's so much inequality, what can we do about it? The reality is that more gender equality can create stronger communities, more innovation, and GDP growth in the double digits. Governments and private sector leaders have major work to do to correct the scenario, but we cannot sit back and wait for things to improve on their own. We have to act concretely and urgently. At this time of adjustment in international economies, we have the opportunity to promote deep reforms to address the structural problems that have traditionally hindered the full development of women and their professional progress. The IDB is implementing its Vision 2025, a blueprint for getting the region not only back on its feet, but laying the groundwork for growth that is sustainable and inclusive. Our plan is both proactive and strategic, working with both the public and private sectors to take advantage of the opportunities that are opening up without falling back into past models that have worsened or overlooked gender gaps. In our lending and technical support, we are prioritizing small and medium-sized businesses, strengthened value chains, digitalization, climate action, and of course, gender equality and inclusion as a cross-cutting element of development. Last year, we invested more than 700 million in projects whose main goal is to promote gender equality or equal economic opportunities in our countries. And that effort takes a wide variety of forms. In Chile, the bank has been working with Laboratoria, a social entrepreneurship initiative to train women who are small entrepreneurs in the digital transformation of their firms. It is one among many of our investments to help close the gender-based skills gap and digital divide. Through our work with the Women Entrepreneurs Financing Initiative, or WeFi, we are mobilizing more than $230 million for women entrepreneurs and women-led businesses. And in Uruguay, the IDB helped finance and develop the National Integrated Care System to expand high quality services for young children. Such advances help women balance their professional and domestic lives, promoting equality. Through WeExchange, created by IDB Lab, our Innovation for Inclusion Laboratory, we are providing a critical platform to connect women entrepreneurs in STEM fields. 
Mobilizing and crowding in the private sector, which is hungrier for ESG investments than ever, is a key goal of our Vision 2025. And that extends to our work on gender, including through our private sector arm, IDB Invest. In 2021, IDB Invest provided a $15 million loan to a key business inclusion council in Mexico that will promote greater access to the microcredit segment for companies led by women. And the IDB's historic Private Sector Partners Coalition has gathered some of the world's leading companies to develop gender projects in partnership with us. These efforts, and many others like them, are all accompanied by our investments in healthcare, the reduction of gender-based violence, education initiatives, and inclusion targets across our portfolio. I'm very proud to tell you that several months ago in Uruguay, the bank approved its first ever investment loan focused exclusively on fighting gender-based violence. And in Peru, we are supporting a national strategy for preventing violence against women, a first in Latin America. The crisis generated by the pandemic has highlighted the opportunity and the need to develop innovative tools and solutions, and to spread the word far and wide that empowered women will drive the sustainable and inclusive recovery that we need in Latin America and the Caribbean. Collectively, the public sector, the private sector, development institutions, NGOs, and the public need to ensure that the future generation of women, students, workers, entrepreneurs, and decision makers get a fair shot, is empowered to make an impact, and knows that their leadership is encouraged and celebrated. So today, while we listen to the perspectives of our panelists, I invite you to think about how you too can be part of the change and how can you encourage a more equal, more prosperous future for our region. And just like you, the IDB will keep working to make this vision a reality. Thank you. Muchas gracias por Thank you very much for these inspiring opening remarks. The public sector is key to promoting the advances in gender equity in the region. Uh, that's why today we have representation from private companies and academia. Panelists joining us for this exciting conversation today are Darren Ware, Senior Vice President of Government Engagement at MasterCard. Welcome. Diane Edwards, President of the Jamaica Promotions Corporation, and Dr. Maria Elena Botassi, Co-Director of the Texas uh, Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development at Baylor College of Medicine, nominated for the 2022 Nobel Peace Prize. To reach gender equity, we need to count on the participation of all sectors of civil society, the public sector, private companies, and academia. The panelists joining us for this exciting conversation today represent each one of these sectors. I already introduced our panelists, so let's begin by asking, what was the defining moment in your professional career? where you realized uh, the importance of gender equity in your own work environment. Let's start with Maria Elena. Thank you very much, Gabby. It is a pleasure to be here with you during this panel discussion. I must say my experience was really it came by surprise, even though uh, I've been in the academic sector for some time, but we've tried looking for that uh, position as a uh, a professor, for example, in an academic institution, when you're doing that, you realize that there are many challenges involved in competing for positions and also to try to be accepted in and getting a position as a professor, for example. So these are very key challenges because Although you're just as qualified and as many other applicants, but as a woman, I think this was the first challenge that I really encountered. I studied at the National University of Honduras and I got my doctorate degree. But once I began looking uh, for a job and to begin my academic career, it was fairly evident that women need to develop a strategy in order to be able to compete. So I think that was where I realized that you needed to 
make changes and participate in activities that will give us the same recognition as other applicants from other genders. So the idea is changing attitudes, changing mindsets. Is that uh, pretty much accurate, Maria Elena? Yes, I think both need to be changed. You need to be able to change. Well, our, our own self-esteem is also a very important thing, and it needs to be <coughs> changed. We need to open up the, uh, the fields of opportunity so that we can attain academic positions. But it's also a question of changing uh, the institutional culture and mindset. And I think that is taking place. We're seeing now these uh, recruitment uh, strategies that uh, recruit women in science and in academics. So I think it's basically a change of the institutional culture as well. And within the academic institutions, we're seeing the perspective how can we make progress in our academic uh, professional career where we can have more opportunities to compete and advance in our profession and uh, take on uh, leadership positions administrative positions in academic institutions and in our own um, laboratory environment as well thank you uh, maria elena so, Diane, what was that moment, that defining moment? Thanks for the question, and I'm really glad to be here this morning because I think it's such an important topic. You know, I searched my memory to find to figure out what was the moment, and I couldn't find that specific moment. But I think as a young person entering the professional realm, what got to me was that Jamaica is quite a paradox because we have a lot of professional women in Jamaica, but yet at the top of the tree, you still have a lot of males. And so it was the moment when I sort of started to feel excluded from the drinks after work, from the jokes that were made, from the, um, the part of the conversation which became very male. And I think that for me, it started me understanding that there is really an old boys network at work still and that there is an exclusion of women within that old boys network and i think that we really have to start to break those barriers by being professional women but also by really changing the way we socialize because in jamaica we have the highest number of female managers per capita we also have 70% of campus enrollment that is female. We also have a huge number of women in the public sector, but we still have only, we have less than 20% of women on boards. So it's really trying to, to move women up into that leadership um, section of the population. A uh, follow-up question. Um, Many women probably would have uh, had the same experience, but not taken the path that you took. What do you say to those girls, young women, who would walk through the same path, hearing, you know, naysayers that really make the change for you, that make you take the step and take you where you are now? Well, you know, I would say never believe that there is any limit for you as a woman. There are no limits. We can be anything we want to be. And that goes from astronauts to scientists to agriculturalists to policemen. You know, whatever we want to do, just really believe in yourself. I spent the first 15 years of my life wanting to be a boy. And so it took me a long time to realize, and it was through reading and through interaction with female role models that I realized it's actually empowering to be a woman. And I think that that for me was kind of the big eureka moment. I can do all the things I want to do. I don't have to be a boy to do them. So I would say to girls, just be yourself, go out there. We are powerful. Qué importante idea. That's such an important concept that we don't need to be males. We don't need to be boys to reach 
our uh, our potential. Este es, un, este es un conocimiento muy importante. Ahora, más allá de lo personal. Well, beyond the personal aspect, my question is, why does gender equity represent an opportunity for growth in your sector and for the region overall? Diane, let's start with you, Diane. So, you know, uh, gender equality is critical. As I said, Jamaica is a bit of a paradox because we have all these women who are active, who are powerful, who are out there. But we still have much far fewer women um, who are in employment than men. So a lot of the new industries that we are bringing in to Jamaica, so for instance, the outsourcing industry in which we have been very successful, that tends to be female dominated at the lower level. But we need more female leadership because all the studies have shown that females have greater balance of empathy and ambition, less ego-driven, more co coherent, more collective, more working for the group, for the team. And I think we need to st start to engender some of those softer skills into our workplaces and into our leadership because that will drive us further and that will drive male productivity as well as female productivity, which is a big challenge in the region. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Eh, Darren, ¿cómo se diferencia esto en el sector privado? Darren, is it the same in the private sector? Well, I think what happens is gender equity is it's an opportunity in financial services, right? Because the segment is under targeted and the services are often not designed specifically for women. So the banks and fintechs that understand that soon are going to have the opportunity to both bring those women into the financial system, many of them that are not yet customers but also to gain very high customer loyalty if they do it properly. We can see this in women getting their first debit card and being able to more effectively manage household expenses or female business owners who can now build credit history that enables business loans for their SMB, right? So we've worked with, for example, USAID in, in our initiative in StartPath in Pudera, in Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. Mm -hmm. While we were mentoring these 40 companies that were all women-led, We were doing that, making a lot of noise. During that time, our banking partners also registered 50,000 new accounts for women, right? So they were, we were helping these women-led companies. All of this noise from the banks led to also more inclusion in the accounts for women in, in those countries. Now, um, explain to me, please. It feels like we've heard this message before, and by that I mean years ago microfinance, women, the relevance of helping women, you know, getting microcredits, microloans, etc. Why do we have the feeling or the sense or perception that this message hasn't gone like, you know, it's not instilled yet as a golden rule, if you know what I mean, Darren? Right. We're making progress, but there's more to do. For example, over the last two, two and a half years, we have created more than 100 million digital accounts across Latin America and the Caribbean with our fintech partners. At the same time, there are still 200 million people that are unbanked or underbanked in Latin America and the Caribbean. Obviously, of those 200 million, a great portion of them, or half at least, are women. So there is still more to do. We're, we're making progress, you know, by 20 million uh, people at a time. There are more to do. That's what I'm, uh, we're working today, for example, with the Partnership for Central America, where we committed to driving five million more people just in these three countries of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, five million more people for financial inclusion in these, in these countries. There's still more to do is the, is the, um, is the key message. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Gracias, Darren. Desde la Academia, ¿qué opinas, Marielena? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Darren. From the academic sector, from your perspective, what do you think, uh, Marielena? Well, after listening to Diane and Darren, I think academia is the right place to educate and uh, provide incentives and create a greater interest by women at, at, at a certain point in their careers that they're interested in. They need to take the opportunity to look for that interdisciplinary approach. I really support if a woman 
is interested in a specific professional career like engineering or health or mathematics, you need to combine the opportunities that the academic sector provides in order to incorporate these soft skills that Diane was talking about, to learn how to better engage with people in a sincere conversation and legal this conversation, how to interact, an interdisciplinary approach. When, of course, you're studying a career, you want to focus on one area, you're developing your professional career path. But today, more than ever, we see that that's just not enough to just focus in one path, one area. You need to develop a holistic approach. And at the same time, you need to learn those skills and at the same time be able to use them and acquire new tools in negotiation, for example, when you want to progress in, in you want to promote yourself in on the job, or how to establish networks in order to create a mentorship or a mentoring structure. How do we open new doors of opportunity and career advancement? So I think the academic sector is the core. It's the base of this. This is where you need to start and provide tools to future careers for women as they get into the public or private sector. So within the academic structure, or system, what do you see as potential opportunities to make this a reality? Well, I think we are changing things in the academic sector, not only in terms of the academic programs that are much more multidisciplinary, where women now have greater access to careers that in the past were defined as male-dominated careers, physics, mathematics, engineering sciences. Now you have much greater access for women to enter into these uh, professional career paths. However, we also see changes where there's an opportunity to learn to how to uh, develop that connectivity in order to create these mentorship links where we can obviously develop skills with groups of faculty and institutions, foundations that open up our perspectives so that we have a much wider view and perspective so that we're better prepared to deal with the real world. Because sometimes the academic environment is very didactic. Today, it's becoming much more of an applicable more an application to the real life situation. Thank you, uh, Maria Elena. And I think one thing that we all agree is that greater equity is better for business, for society, for families. So when we talk about the cooperation that we can achieve, how can we develop those synergies with those other sectors that are represented here in the panel? If I can get back to you, Maria Elena, go ahead. Well, I believe that it's essential that we have that communication and that at the same time we de develop these partnerships, consortia, in between the academic sector, public-private partnerships with the, the labor and uh, public-private labor aspects, because the workforce and the creation of and the development of women that are going to enter the, the workforce, they have to have an opportunity during their studies to see exactly where they see themselves positioned as they embark on a professional career, whether the public or private sector, which is the source of their jobs. So within the, and they have to be learning that within the academic experience. And I think we're seeing that much more. The opportunities, for example, are through inter internships and applying during their academic studies to be able to see exactly where they fit, where the women fit in these professional career paths. Where can they start a new job? And that, and also, how can they continue to advance and get promoted? So 
If I could just ask you all to include in your response, when we talk about you, in the women's career paths, you also have maternity, you, they have to take maternity leave, and there's a potential for loss of job opportunities. So what kind of cooperation are we seeing in that area? What's absent? What still needs to be included in that uh, cooperation between the three sectors? What can be done, Maria Elena, in dealing with these aspects? Well, I think we're already seeing changes in that regard. I think we're seeing more uh, equality in terms of sharing those responsibilities between parents, mothers, fathers. I think we're seeing in the, uh, not just in the academic circles where we're more flexible, but to see how both public and private sector entities are now providing opportunities to, in other words, don't discourage women or men for that matter, be able to take leave. When, and this is an opportunity, a shared opportunity. We're seeing, for example, more and more fathers are taking as much of a role, sometimes an even greater role in uh, rearing children when a new baby is born. So I think we're already evolving to the point where there's much more equality in terms of sharing parental responsibility so that we don't have women thinking that they're facing some disadvantage or hurdle in dealing and rearing children. And I think now we're seeing a much more shared responsibility. Thank you, Maria Elena. Talking to some Central American women, and you, women, and you mentioned uh, the case of Central America. Some of them, when asked to be mentors, they say they they pretty much mock at us, saying, "When we don't even have time." So when we talk about collaboration, can you also add this factor, please? How does the uh, private sector tackle this, including um, this other factor? Well, a couple of the a couple of comments, Gabriela. I think um, if we think about the maternity leave piece, that's one. At Mastercard, we have extensive maternity leave and paternity leave. Right, that has grown. The other part of that that I don't see as structurally there yet is we have maternity leave, but we don't have so much care and preparation by the company for helping the woman who's out. Now, obviously, at a very busy, critical time. How do we help her? So many times they take their maternity leave, but they have to find their replacement. They have to help that replacement get up to speed. And then they have to come back and it's all it's all um, on them instead of being on the company. Companies have advanced in maternity and paternity leave, but they have to take more responsibility also for helping manage as a corporation that space and that, that time, right? I think um, in terms of other things that we do and we push and see as important in the industry, the 30% club as a leadership, driving leadership at the board level or at the company level where 30% of the boards could be female. We do that across the region as well. Um, we, we have equal pay ourselves and a tremendous amount of diversity across all levels of the company and something that we continue to, to push and push. It's, it's critical, it drives better productivity, more um, collaboration. And in our role for working with governments also, it's fundamental. Governments serve everyone, right? And so I have multiple um, fantastic women on my team and how they can carry the message to the governments is, is impressive and fundamental to our success. Mm -hmm. so Gabriella, if I might come in yes. for, for one point there, I think there are three points I'd like to make. One is I think that we need to see greater blending between the public and the private sector and academia. So more movement among the three. So we just came out of a really great experience where one of our vice presidents who has actually never worked in the private sector went on a three month internship with, well, a learning experience, let's call it, with a private sector company, just to have that experience of understanding from the inside what their challenges are. So I think that that creating that channel where you can have cross fertilization, I think that's critical. The other thing is that um, in the Caribbean, we have embraced the 30 percent um, of board members should be female. We have embraced that. We are now at about 17 percent. So we're not anywhere near there yet, but we are working towards it. And Parliament has actually passed legislation in Jamaica to that effect. 
And I think the, the third point is that we are starting the whole discussion about paternity leave, because until men really, and, and we are, as I said, a paradox in the Caribbean, because we are male dominated, but many households, 46% in Jamaica are headed by females. So you've got this paradox going on of the reality tends to be female headed, although the society tends to be male dominated. So we need to start to understand paternity leave and father's rights in a sense, because fathers have to assume their responsibilities. So I think that it is in those ways that we are going to see an advancement of female um, equality because we still don't have enough daycare. We still don't have enough support mechanisms for women as they go on maternity leave and return to the workplace. So all of these issues need to be resolved together. Um, a question probably for Darren, following up on these fantastic um, ideas that the blending that you mentioned, uh, Diane. Um, in Latin America, the blending process, the um, interaction process between the government and the private sector, is it easier nowadays? Is it harder nowadays? Does it require to have a woman on each side for it to happen? What's your experience, Darren? Well, that's one reason I think our, our team is called government engagement, right? We work with governments to try and help them solve their issues of financial inclusion, of subsidies disbursement during the pandemic for emergency assistance to all parts of the, of the population to driving um, the SMEs and support for them for the economic recovery. I think, I think all of those things are, are good uh, examples. There's more to happen, right? The governments have so much to do. During pandemic, they had so much emergency. And um, what we're doing today, again, in this Partnership for Central America is a great example of something that started with Kamala Harris. She made a call to action to the private sector. We got involved, Microsoft is involved, Nespresso is involved. And now we are working very closely with, um, with the governments across the region and here in Central America to help them achieve their digital agendas, right? Their digital agendas include uh, gender, diversi gender diversity, financial inclusion, um, transparency in all of the financial flows that they touch, for example. Uh, María Elena, would you say it requiere una mujer para que sea ese blending, esa, digamos... Does it require a woman to do this blending that with a virtual communication and interactions? <clears throat> well, obviously, we do have to play a role with the same responsibility, the same responsibility that the male gender would have. But it's true. I believe that in the uh, the idea of taking on the reins our own reins in order to uh, progress i think as darren already indicated and he talked about kamala harris's uh, initiative she took on the reins of responsibility the call to action how can we empower women with a a, a perspective in Central America, Mesoamerica, and the Caribbean. So I think just that alone, I think, is an incentive that in, has encouraged women. Women are now being more and more invited to take a place at the table in order to contribute to uh, perspective on our own needs, specific needs, and also achieving that balance in terms of the exchange and flow of ideas. And also I want to highlight that cultural intelligence is vital here because we, we're all human, we're Latin Americans, and our cultures, our roots, also govern <clears throat> to a certain extent how decisions are made and how quickly can we change and adapt to these uh, imbalances in terms of gender equality. That's why I think it's important to be able to bring in organizations like MasterCard and other organizations that have a very uh, broad perspective but how can we bring all that together so that we they can be adaptable to our own regions with all of their challenges, including infrastructure, government challenges? That's crucial. 
to have that mindset, to be able to grasp that uh, cultural intelligence and how to adapt it in the region. Well, if you could just give us uh, some examples, I want to talk about some of the cha what changes have been effective in promoting women's leadership in each one of your sectors. Could you give us a specific example and some of the positive effects and consequences that has that could be perhaps replicated elsewhere. Let's start with Diane. Um, I would say having a female prime minister hmm. in Jamaica um, was really, really important because hmm. again, it's that symbol hmm. that breaks the ceiling and that says we can do it. Um, I th and I think that goes for a number of people. We now have um, Prime Minister Motley in Barbados, who's a huge inspiration to a lot of people. Kamala Harris is a huge inspiration. And so I think having those role models has really been critical for the region. Thank you. Darren? Yeah, I think so. We're at a critical time. We had several female presidents in Latin America in the mm -hmm. past. Bachelet, Laura Chinchilla, um, so many. And now we have today 1 billion girls under the age of 18 around the world. They can become the largest generation of women leaders, entrepreneurs, promoters for change, all of these things. Um, and, and we have some examples across Latin America and the Caribbean of female leaders right now. <clears throat> but we have to see and we have to try to do more, right? One thing we're doing, we have a, an initiative called Girls for Tech, where we are trying to bring to them the academic and um, kind of critical 21st century skills that they need in science and technology. 25 million girls is our target. We're doing that in Latin America and that we hope will help that 1 billion girls around the world to become those leaders in technology and science and business and government and that they will be better prepared to do that in this next generation, which is very important. Absolutely, claro que sí. En la academia, María Elena. What about in the academic uh, environment? Well, it's very similar. We've seen an impact. Um, and of course, we still need more examples of women in leadership positions, leading uh, academic institutions. And within the... Uh, in not just schools, but in other career paths, I think that's essential. But in particular... We, within the academic sector, we have to have those paths for career advancement in terms of faculty and professors. Not only do we need to have uh, gender equality among the student body, but also provide incentives and opportunities within the faculties of universities so that we can have more women sharing in these uh, institutions um, activities and changes because that's where the role models come into play that's where we develop the narratives of how women cannot just be a student and learn and be successful but can also be successful as professionals and how they can balance their individual personal responsibilities and professional responsibilities i think that's where we need to see a greater proliferation of women leaders in latin america Yes, the uh, role of women in government positions. We've heard Jamaica, the United States with Vice President Kamala Harris to aspire to uh, achieve those same roles in both cases. So I would like to just to conclude our discussion by asking, just imagine the future. Imagine, and if we were to progress in gender equality, and I as a journalist, uh, I would like to just ask if you could give me what headline that you would like to wake up tomorrow or in 2025, what's the headline you'd like to see in the news? I'd, let's start with there. In 2025, we have just released research that shows and proves that women-led businesses drove pandemic recovery in Latin America. That's my headline. I want it because I want, I think we can drive the profitability of gender initiatives at banks and fintechs. That can happen as well as increase the productivity and sustainability of those women-led businesses that emerged during the pandemic with agility, with productivity, with all these things. 
Um, it's now been proven that the women led the recovery after the pandemic. Wow, I'm gonna add that to my calendar for 2025 and try to make sure that that happens. Diane? Yeah, I, lo I loved what Darren said. So thanks for that, Darren, that's brilliant. Um, I'd love to see the headline that says 50% of CEOs of Fortune 500 companies are female and wow. that it's no longer a big deal because we have one company in Jamaica which has an all-female board and they're kind of like, wow, this is an all-female board. But why is that so important? Why it's just a board. How many boards are 100% male? It's not a big deal. So I wanna see when we are 50-50 out there and then it's just commonplace that women are in leadership position. Yes, so the feeling would be different when it's not an issue. Exactly. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Maria Elena, tu titular ideal? What would, would be your headline, your dream headline? My dream headline would be for universities, or education um, institutions in Central America and the Caribbean are at the forefront of training of women uh, who become leaders around the world. And um, I think that's a combination of um, encouraging our academic institutions uh, in our region uh, to become uh, leaders in the creation of leaders into the future, but with specific target that they be at the forefront because they're led by women and they are educating the women of the future. Absolutely. And if you allow me... twenty-five would need to have women that are called with different name, a different name, but similar to a Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, a Sundar Pichai, and so many others uh, who are fantastic entrepreneurs, pero líderes globales, mujeres. Those would be female leaders, global leaders who are just as visible. And there are some, just like they're journalists at, uh, at CNN in my case. So thank you so much for this very interesting conversation. All of those headlines seem to be less of a dream. Next, we will hear from a very special guest. Thank you once again, everyone, for sharing your stories and lessons with us. I found this conversation really inspiring, and I'm sure our audience did as well. Let me now introduce our Executive Vice President, Reina Mejia, who will offer some closing remarks. Reina is helping transform the IDB by leading a wide range of initiatives, including our working group for diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as our ambitious work on operational excellence. Reina, the floor is yours. Gracias, Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. On behalf of the bank, I would especially like to thank our guests, Darren, Maria Elena, and Diane, for the interesting conversation so skillfully moderated by Gabriela. And I would also like to thank each and every one of you who've joined us today on this seminar. When we decided to organize this event, our objective was to talk about the role of women in creating, in transforming our region in order to accelerate growth, in order to get to have the Latin America and Caribbean region we all yearn for and for which we work tirelessly every day. That region where our children, both boys and girls, can hope to have the same dreams and the same goals because they have access to the same opportunities. After what we've heard, I think we've managed to move the conversation to a new level. And apart from moving the conversation, the examples shared today show that gender equality is becoming more and more of a reality. Today, we have seen how this perspective helps our economies to make the jump they need. All of this through concrete actions such as equal pay between men and women for similar work, the participation of women in science and technology courses and careers, and the increase in the number of women leaders in business, government, organizations, and academia. It is estimated that 1.3 million businesses in Latin America and the Caribbean are owned or led by women. But 70% of the times, those women can't access the credit they require 
due to gender bias. This is limiting growth and job creation. We are getting to see how this is changing, but it needs to change even more and faster. If we were to eliminate the gender gap in the labor market, the region's GDP would increase by 23%, which would add $1 billion to the economy. In a nutshell, it can be said that no other policy offers such a powerful return on investment in order to foster socioeconomic growth as the empowerment of women. It is a large investment, but in order for this to work, we must keep up the fight against gender-based sexual violence in all forms and in all areas. And we must do even more, such as work in order for the care of dependents in our families not to fall on the shoulders of women only. It should be a shared responsibility so that women can have time to invest in their personal and professional development. One of the greatest tasks we all have here, both men and women, is to ensure that the region's women feel and are empowered and for them to know that they can count on us, on each and every one of us. We are convinced that when women advance, the economies win, companies win, our children, sons and daughters win. At the end of the day, we all win. This is why this is one of the strategic pillars of our Vision 2025. I would like to conclude on a note of urgency and optimism. The headlines imagined for 2025 have really filled me with a lot of enthusiasm, not only because they portray the region we want, but because after this conversation it's become clear that they are a possible reality. In particular, what Darren mentioned, women have led the economic recovery of Latin America and the Caribbean. At the IDB, we work precisely to offer concrete solutions with a gender perspective. Maria Elena mentioned the enormous importance of academia in training women and preparing them for the labor market. I couldn't agree more. At the bank, we have initiatives that tackle this matter from childhood, such as the Little Adventurous program we developed with Sesame Street and the Colombian Family Welfare Institute in order to reduce the learning gaps during the preschool period. In Costa Rica, we have fostered um, and encouraged young women and adults to sign up for STEM uh, programs and uh, to sign up for high school. And in Argentina, IDB Invest, our private sector arm, um, has worked with Central Puerto, a company, to build two wind farms with a commitment to hire more women. And they have done so. Last year, 60% of the positions were covered by women. Initiatives such as these are the ones that are lowering barriers, breaking paradigms, and opening up spaces for more programs deliberately designed to offer opportunities and equality for women. I would like to take home with me what Diane said. Don't believe there are limits. We women can be whatever we want to be. With equality, the opportunities are endless. And at the IDB, our goal is for women to lead the transformation of Latin America and the, and the Caribbean towards a more equitable and more just region. Thank you very much. Dear all, this has been all for today. Thank you for joining us in this look towards the equitable future that we all want also have come a long way in order to believe and grow towards what we want.